This is Sean Blair reporting for ESA Web TV. I'm here in a clean room store in ESA's STEC Technical Center in the Netherlands. And kept within here are a few tiny pieces of some of the rarest, most precious material imaginable. It's come a very long way to get here. Japan's Hayabusa spacecraft was the world's first mission to retrieve samples from the surface of an asteroid and return them to Earth. It nearly didn't make it. Launched in 2003, Hayabusa was damaged by a solar flare during its trip through space, finally reaching the rubble pile asteroid Itokawa in late 2005. When Hayabusa deployed its mini lander, it was lost in space. So instead, Hayabusa itself made attempts to gather samples, firing projectiles to gather up dust into sample containers. At one point, Hayabusa even crash landed into the surface while out of contact with Earth. But the asteroid's low gravity meant Hayabusa was still able to head back to Earth, although it had to be nursed along with frozen pipes, leaky propulsion and failing batteries. In 2010, unsteerable by the end of its 6 billion kilometer journey, the crippled spacecraft approached Earth's atmosphere like an asteroid, breaking apart. Hayabusa's sample container, however, was heat shielded and parachuted back to the Woomera test range in Australia. Until scientists retrieved the small container, they had no idea if it actually had any asteroid samples inside it. And when they opened it, they still had no idea at first. It seemed to be empty. But scraping the sides of the container, followed by detailed scanning with an electron microscope, revealed 1,500 tiny particles that were of extraterrestrial origin. Extremely precious, these Hayabusa grains have become the focus of intense scientific study around the world. And three of them are currently here, at the European Space Agency's STEC Technical Centre in the Netherlands. I'm here now in the lab with uh, space environment researcher Fabrice Cipriani, who's um, lead, been leading the study of the grains. Um, so Fabrice, um, where did they come from? How do we get them here? Well, uh, actually we, we uh, build up a consortium made of uh, uh, researchers from ESA, and also from teams of uh, ENAF in Roma and the Parthenop University in Napoli. Uh, to propose uh, an original study uh, focusing on the electrostatic properties of those particles. And, and that's different from usual. Normally people are interested in what yeah. the materials are made of rather than what they Yeah, exactly, do. exactly. So uh, most of the studies uh, are aimed at uh, uh, measuring the mineralogy, uh, composition, um, uh, basically uh, the uh, fundamental ratios of, of uh, compounds which uh, date uh, which which uh, which uh, helps to date back the grains from the origin of the solar sure. system etc so what's the focus of your research uh, asteroids do not have an atmosphere and as a result their surface is directly exposed to uh, incoming fluxes of charged particles coming from the solar wind uh, coming from the sun uh, so uh, those charged particles they deposit uh, charges into the material. Uh, asteroids, uh, outer surfaces, are layers of very fine uh, particles which uh, dimensions ranging from microns to, to centimeters typically, which are held together by gravity but also by cohesion forces. And on the other hand, they are a bit loose due to the acceleration, due to the rotation of the body, but also due to uh, those electrostatic forces which, which are uh, repelling uh, particles from one another. And the focus of our research is very uh, towards understanding a bit more uh, or characterizing a bit more this type of interaction, electrostatic interaction. And the, uh, the impact of, of those uh, uh, interactions uh, in terms of uh, uh, regolith structure is that, for instance, uh, the porosity or the density of the, the material can be uh, a bit different from what we think it is if we, not, we don't, do not include this component of, of, uh, of the, the, the forces. So future designers of things like drills and instruments, they need to know this to actually for, design? For instance, uh, that, that's a component they might, they might want to be aware of. Uh, and it's especially true if uh, you go a bit deep in the, in the layer, uh, which is most affected by more energetic particles. But uh, uh, the way the, the layer are held together, especially if the, the asteroid body is very small, uh, is affected by such uh, effects. So the, the people designing right. drills might, might be interested to know and, that. And um, could it actually and give a landing spacecraft some kind of electric shock? Yeah, well, so there are uh, various, uh, various effects, let's say. Uh, in general, the risk might be low if you bring those two objects close together. You, you think they might trigger some uh, some static discharge, but the amount of charge, or let's say, energy needed to do that is not very uh, is not high enough in, in in the standard situation. The solar wind particles are not very energetic. 
Now, if we think about uh, situations where we have coronal, for instance, solar storms with higher uh, energy uh, particles, uh, then maybe you can build up a bit more uh, a gradient of potentials uh, leading to uh, some, some risk. And other aspects are indeed the way those uh, uh, layer, the, the outer layer and those particles can separate from the surface uh, being driven by electrostatic force. Uh, which somehow overcome the gravity, which sticks uh, them, which helps helps holding the uh, the whole structure together, and they they can be lifted and transported. And this is something, uh, for instance, Apollo astronauts uh, thought or well, to have observed. Uh, but uh, on the moon, actually, this has never been uh, really uh, confirmed. At least uh, the Apollo missions are a good example of of uh, how. Uh, you know, um, uh, grains can adhere to materials, uh -huh. uh, and uh, this is also due to their very peculiar shapes and the way uh, the, the static, uh, um, uh, let's say, they behave in terms oh. of, of static uh, electricity and, and the way they interact with materials. So, so, so what so do the grains actually look like? First of all, they are very small. Uh, well, the samples we have uh, are about 10 micrometer or 20 micrometer in diameter. Uh, the Hayabusa samples go up to uh, several hundreds of micrometer, but we have very small ones. Uh, also, when you look at them, they, are, they have a very uh, inhomogeneous structure. They are very sharp edges. Uh, this is because they've not been uh, weathered by water, you know, eroded by water like on Earth, or of friction together in the same way as Earth's particles uh, are. And also, uh, you have micro cracks on the surfaces. So they're they are not like one block, they're they are cracked. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, you have micro craters or nano craters actually uh, on them, which is also uh, a witness of the fact that they've been exposed to the outer environment, uh, a bit like uh, all uh, bodies in space, all planetary bodies in space have uh, craters at their surface. Lee, what do you do to them to test them? Yeah, what, what we do is try to reproduce a bit what uh, we have in, the, uh, in, in space, although we can't reproduce, for instance, solar wind in the uh, chamber, but uh, we, we try to bombard them with electrons and uh, measure the amount of charges which are accumulating on the surface and how those charges distribute on the surface. And uh, this is uh, something which has never been really measured at this scale, uh, at least on asteroid material. There, there was some testing done on Apollo samples. Uh, but in fact, because we don't have a lot of, uh, well, actually we have very few of, of those particles, uh, we also uh, play with uh, more, more uh, standard material with, which, which are like, uh, lunar analogs, for instance, like simulants, like simulants lunar uh -huh. simulants, exactly. And, and we can, at the same time, play with uh, full layers. Well, um, what's it actually like to work with the grains themselves? You have to be very careful, I guess. Yes, yes, we are very, very, we are extremely careful. Uh, from the time we received it, uh, we've been thinking uh, for quite a long time, I would say maybe two years, of developing a method which uh, allows to handle them in a safe way, uh, preserving at the same time uh, their outer shape. Because unlike uh, indeed what uh, um, most laboratories uh, do because of their, the, the type of measurements, we, we do not want to embed them in some aerogel or we don't want to press them into uh, uh, a, a, a support and then cut them to, ex to, uh, to investigate their internal structure. And you want to give them back to JAXA? So yeah, indeed. So uh, what we aim for uh, at the end of the study is to, uh, to safely um, uh, bring them, uh, to, to, to give them back to, to JAXA. Uh, so uh, hopefully, uh, when uh, we, uh, w w due to this uh, to this method of handling, they, they will not been they will not have been altered or destroyed uh, by, uh, by our, our, our analysis technique. Right. Well, um, thanks to Abris for showing us around, and indeed Thank thanks you. to Jaxa for being so generous in the first place. The good news is these grains might become a bit less rare in future. A follow-up Jaxa mission, Hayabusa 2, is currently in space due to return with more asteroid samples in late 2020. This is Sean Blair for ESA Web TV, signing off.